Welcome to section one of cardiac embryology. In this section, we'll be discussing the normal development of the heart. Let's get started. Here's an overview of what we'll be discussing, including embryonic precursors, cardiac looping, septation of the atria, septation of the ventricles, and septation of the outflow tract. I'll continue to come back to this slide as we progress through the lecture. Before we discuss the heart, I think it would be helpful if we start from the beginning. This is an overview figure of early fetal development, which we discuss in great detail in section one of reproductive embryology. If you haven't watched that video yet, let me briefly recap some key points. So after fertilization, the blastocyst implants on the uterine wall around day seven. By week three, gastrulation occurs and we get the formation of endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. The mesoderm is the layer which gives rise to the heart. With this in mind, let's look at the developing heart. This is an image of the heart from week three to week four of development. Initially, the heart is a very simple tube. Blood flows into the sinus venosus, which you can see right here, and travels out of the truncus arteriosus, which you can see up at the top part of the image right here. So blood flows like this. The central part of the tube is broken down into several structures. Many of these adult structures are known as smooth or trabeculated parts of the heart. Here's an image of the inside of an adult heart, and we can see some bumpy areas, for example, right here, and these are trabeculated. We can also see some smooth areas, for example, right here. So from the image, you can see that the bulbous cortis will become the smooth parts of the ventricles, and the primitive ventricle and primitive atrium will become the trabeculated portions of the ventricles and atria, respectively. Additionally, the right horn of the sinus venosus will become the smooth part of the right atrium, and the left horn of the sinus venosus will become the coronary sinus. Finally, the truncus arteriosus will become the ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk. A couple days later, around day 23, the heart begins to fold, and in the next image, we can see how this begins to happen. So right here. The bulbous cortis, or BC for short, has moved to the left side of the screen, and the primitive atrium has begun to move upward and somewhat posteriorly. By week four, the heart looks completely different with many important structures and beats spontaneously. Notice that the atria are now behind the ventricles, and we can also see many new vessels beginning to form. We can see that the sinus venosus right here still has a right horn and a left horn. And now we can see the formation of several cardinal veins. The right common cardinal vein and the right anterior cardinal vein will become the superior vena cava, or SVC. The posterior cardinal vein, supracardinal vein, and subcardinal vein will become the inferior vena cava, or IVC. Later in development, the primitive pulmonary vein is formed from the posterior aspect of the primitive left atrium, right here, which is later absorbed into the wall of the left atrium and becomes the smooth part of the left atrium. We haven't included this structure in this image because it hasn't formed yet at day 28, but just know that the primitive left atrium becomes the smooth part of the left atrium. The blood still continues to move up the various veins into the sinus venosus, like this. It then goes to the atria and passes through a rudimentary atrioventricular canal, which you can see right here, into the left ventricle, and finally out the truncus arteriosus. Notice that around this time, endocardial cushions develop. So if we erase this green arrow, we can see these little green dots right here, and these are the endocardial cushions. These grow and divide the heart so that there are two separate canals a right atrioventricular canal, and a left atrioventricular canal. Eventually, the endocardial cushions give rise to the atrial septum, the valves of the heart, and the membranous portions of the interventricular septum. Here's a table that summarizes what we just covered. Here you can see what each embryonic structure becomes in an adult. Here's an image of the adult heart, and we can see many of these structures, such as the SVC, IVC, right atrium, and so forth. If you look at a posterior view of the heart, we can see the coronary sinus right here, and this drains blood from the heart into the right atrium. So far we've discussed embryonic precursors. Now let's move on to discuss cardiac looping. As you hopefully notice, the heart undergoes some pretty intricate looping throughout development. The folding or looping process helps the heart establish the correct orientation with the heart positioned from the right to the left within the thorax. This looping process begins during week four of gestation and requires dynein to work properly. Therefore, if dynein is defective, then this can lead to dextrocardia. The syndrome known to cause this is Cartagener syndrome. We cover this in much more detail in our biochemistry section. 
Here we have two chest x-rays. On the left, we can see what normal looks like. Notice that the heart is oriented towards the patient's left side, so like this. On the right, we can see a chest x-ray of dextrocardia. As you can see, the orientation of the heart is reversed and is now towards the patient's right side, like this. All right, now let's transition and discuss septation of the atria and ventricles. Remember from this image the endocardial cushions right here? This is where all the magic happens, so let's take a frontal section through this portion of the heart while we discuss septation. Here we can see inside of the atria and ventricles, allowing us to better see the septae that are forming. Pay close attention to the coloring schematic and the legend here on the bottom. Notice that we will be discussing the septum primum, septum secundum, muscular interventricular septum, and membranous interventricular septum. From the last image, we saw the endocardial cushions forming, and in this image, we can see the endocardial cushions right here. A structure known as the septum primum, which again is in blue right here, begins to develop from the top part of the heart and grows downward towards the endocardial cushion. The space that is initially between the two atria is called the foramen primum. In the next image, we can see that the septum primum continues to grow downward, but that another space opens up, and this is called the foramen secundum. We can also still see the foramen primum right here before the septum primum fuses with the endocardial cushions and closes this opening. A little later, we can see that the foramen primum is gone, and now the septum secundum, which is shown in this green color right here, begins to grow from the top part of the heart. Next, the septum secundum simultaneously grows from the top part of the heart and the bottom part of the heart, and then stops to leave an opening known as the foramen ovale, which you can see right here. This intricate formation of the atrial septum is important because it allows fetal blood to bypass the lungs and go directly from the right atrium to the left atrium, so like this. In the final image, we can see the foramen ovale and the septum primum degenerating a bit, right here. The foramen ovale, along with the widened foramen secundum, allows blood to move through these two holes like this. After birth, the foramen ovale usually closes, and the atrial septum fully forms as all of the tissues fuse together. All right, that's formation of the atrial septum. Now let's discuss the interventricular septum. If we go back to the beginning of this image, we can see that the muscular portion of the interventricular septum develops from the bottom part of the heart right here. Again, if we look at our key, we can see that this is the muscular interventricular septum. In the second image, we can see that it grows upward towards the endocardial cushion. This growth continues and then stops about two-thirds of the way there. At this point, the membranous portion of the interventricular septum begins to grow downward from the endocardial cushion, which you can see right here. Eventually, the two cushions fuse, forming a solid septum between the two ventricles. For step one, you should know that a defect in the membranous portion of the interventricular septum is the most likely cause of a ventricular septal defect. Okay, let's finish up by discussing septation of the outflow tract. If we return to this image, we can see that the heart has folded around in a pretty unique shape right here. Now let's take a frontal section through the ventricles around this point in time so we can see inside of the truncus arteriosus and the ventricles. Here we can see inside of the ventricular chambers. Blood from the atria enters the ventricles through the atrioventricular canals. In the first image, we can also see that the muscular portion of the interventricular septum, right here, is beginning to grow upward from the bottom portion of the ventricles. In the next image, we can see that the aorticopulmonary septum is beginning to form in the outflow tract right here. So again, the blue dotted line represents the aorticopulmonary septum. This occurs as neural crest cells and endocardial cells migrate to this area. This is probably the most high yield point to remember of the entire lecture, because if neural crest cells fail to migrate to this area, then conotruncal cardiac abnormalities can develop, such as tetralogy of Fallot, transposition of the great vessels, and persistent truncus arteriosus. So remember, in order for the aorticopulmonary septum to form, neural crest cells must migrate to this area. In the last image, we can see that the aorticopulmonary septum is formed and twisted around, creating an outflow tract for the right ventricle and an outflow tract for the left ventricle. Eventually, these two separate outflow tracts will become the pulmonary trunk and the ascending aorta. Also notice that the muscular portion of the interventricular septum grew upward, which we can see right here and that part of the aortical pulmonary septum fused with it, which contributed to the formation of the membranous portion of the interventricular septum. So here we've labeled it membranous interventricular septum. So you can see that we've stated that both the endocardial cushion and the aortical pulmonary septum contribute to the formation of the membranous portion of the interventricular septum.
All right, now that we've covered the information, let's review with a question. A newborn with a cardiac murmur is found to have a ventricular septal defect. The physician informs the parents that this most likely occurred due to failure of what embryological structure to develop properly. All right, so pretty straightforward. As I mentioned earlier, a VSD is most commonly due to failure of the membranous portion of the interventricular septum to develop properly. From this image, we can see the membranous portion of the interventricular septum right here. Less frequently, failure of the muscular portion of the interventricular septum to develop properly can result in a VSD as well. So in answer to the question, a VSD is most commonly due to failure of the membranous portion of the interventricular septum to develop properly. And with that, we've covered everything you need to know regarding normal cardiac development.